This is Megan Mitchell, and I'm going to go over our three hardest ASWB practice questions on the Agents of Change exam number three. And what does this mean? These are the questions that our clients have gotten wrong or incorrect most frequently. So I wanted to kind of debunk those for you all. So a quick overview of what you need to know for test day is that there's three types of test questions on the ASWB exam. The first is recall. These are very basic and they require you to remember a fact or a concept. You're just pretty much memorizing some information and you're able to answer the question based on that. For the master's and clinical level exams, you will see very few recall questions, but there will be some sprinkled in throughout. The second type of questions are application questions, and these require you to not only recall basic information, but then you need to take it a step further in your learning and apply it to a case scenario, a vignette, or a real life situation. So it's taking that learning up a degree of difficulty. And it, these recall application reasoning are in order of difficulty level. You will see a lot of application questions on the exam. Last is reasoning questions, and these are the hardest. These are the most difficult because they require more skills as you are approaching them. They require you to recall and, and apply information, but also take that information, there's often a lot of information, synthesize it, so what is important, pull out those details, examine it, and then problem solve. So these are going to take a little bit more brain power, problem solving, and sometimes examples of these questions are questions that might give you distractor information, or these might be ethical decision-making questions where it's not very clear cut what's going on. There might be some gray area and you have to really think things through and put the clues together. So let's go ahead and jump into the first question we are going to go over. I will read it. I'll read the answer questions and then I'll give you time to pause and answer the question if you're doing this in real time. Question number one, a social worker is conducting a session with a client who discusses a recent personal challenge. The social worker aims to ensure effective and empathetic communication. How can the social worker demonstrate congruence to effectively support the client during the session? A, adopt a professionally empathetic demeanor using facial expressions and tone of voice that reflect understanding and respect for the client's experiences while maintaining professional boundaries. B, respond with positive affirmations and assurances, even if these do not match the social worker's genuine facial reactions to show alliance with the client. C, align facial expressions, tone of voice, and body language with empathetic and supportive words when responding to the client's situation. Or D, listen attentively to the client's world words while observing nonverbal cues to fully understand the emotional context and respond in a manner that generally reflects the social worker's understanding and empathy. This one's a tough one because one very clearly outlines congruence. The others are all good things you should do in the therapeutic setting, but one specifically points to congruence and I want you to think of that when answering this question. So go ahead, I will give you a few moments here. Okay. What is the correct answer? The correct answer is C, align facial expressions tone of voice, and body language with empathetic and supportive words when responding to the client's situation. So this one's tricky because A, B, and D are, B can be ruled out immediately. You want to match their reactions. You want to show alliance with the client. And you don't want to be disingenuine and put on a fake emotion or a fake affirmation for the client. So B is out. We also want to be genuine with the client which leads us to A, D, and C. A is appropriate, right? We want to reflect and respect their experiences, but that's not necessarily what congruence is. Congruence is really about attunement and alignment. So, for example, if the client is expressing something in a more 
boisterous manner, we might posture ourselves a different way or meet that energy level. If they're talking very quietly, we might meet them or align with them or in tune with them by bringing our own voice level down. So A is good, but it's not that necessarily demonstrating congruence. So A is out. And then D is out um, because that's just more empathetic listening. You definitely want to listen to their words. You want to observe their nonverbal cues, but that doesn't go far enough in aligning and attuning to that. So C is the correct answer because it's all about attunement with congruence and matching the client's reactions, their body language, their voice level. Here's the rationale for you. Congruence involves aligning facial expressions, tone of voice, body language with empathetic and supportive words. This fosters trust and effective client support. I work with children, so this happens a lot. If they have big energy, I meet them with big energy. Or we sometimes do some different activities in the session where we're modulating, right? They're matching my energy and I'm matching their energy. And why is this important? It, meant, it, it really allows us to be genuine and shows authenticity, right? We don't need to be upbeat and cheery for every single interaction we have that can seem disgenuine. And we need to match their feelings and their intentions, but also being also in line with our own as well. Question number two, a social worker is working with a couple considering divorce with two young children involved. The couple reports frequent arguments and concerns about the impact on their children. The social worker's initial approach should include, A, exploring the couple's goals and values, considering the entire family's well-being. B, addressing communication issues and exploring how their conflicts affect their children. C, discussing options, including counseling or separation, focusing on the family's needs, or facilitating a safe, safe space for open dialogue about their relationship and its impact on the children. Once again, some of these answers are correct in the sense that it wouldn't be wrong to do this, but we are specifically looking that they, they come in, they are frequently arguing, and they're concerned about how this arguing impacts their children. What do we do? We need to be very targeted here. So go ahead, I'm gonna pause here and give you some time to answer this one. Okay, what would I immediately rule out? I'm gonna rule out C. I'm not going to ever suggest separation um, or discussing those options with the client if that's not what they want. So C would be out. Um, D, facilitating a safe space for open dialogue. That should be happening. But if they are frequently arguing, they're contemplating divorce, we need to work on communication first, right? And we need to get to the place where we can address this first so that we can facilitate the safe space. So D is out. C is out. We are down to A and B. A is not a bad answer, right? Exploring their goals and values, considering the entire family's well-being, but it doesn't directly address what they have stated is the problem, the frequent arguments and how this is impacting children. So the correct answer here is B, addressing communication issues and exploring how their conflicts affect the, their children. Why is this the best answer to initially start with, that's what they're coming for. If we don't address the communication and explore how this is potentially affecting their children, we're not able to do what they set out to do in treatment. The rationale for this question is that by focusing on specifically the communication, which is what they said was the problem, this will help them better understand the effects that this is having on their their children, on their family unit, and they can work towards a more harmonious relationship. This is acknowledging why they came in, that they have um, some sort of conflict in their interactions, and this is affecting their children. So like I said, the other answer choices are not incorrect, but they do not directly answer the issue that the clients are coming in for. So a lot of times with these really tricky questions, you have to really kind of use that information synthesis to find the correct answer. 
Our last question we will cover is question number three. A social worker in a child welfare agency during a home visit observes unsafe and unsanitary conditions that put children at risk. What is the social worker's immediate action in this situation? A, document the observations and report to the supervisor. B, leave the home and report the situation to CPS. C, confront the parents about the unsafe conditions or D, offer to clean the home for the family. So here it's really important that you know what your role is as a child welfare agency worker and what type of work you would be doing with a client in this case. So go ahead and take some time to answer this one. So let's rule out the extremes here. What am I not going to do? I'm not going to confront the parents about the unsafe conditions. That's not supportive. That's not meeting with the client where they're at. I want to understand more about maybe what some of the barriers are. I'm not going to offer to clean the home for the family. That could be some support that they might need, but that is not problem solving, right? That is not empowering the client. It's not setting out to do this collaboratively. So C is out as D is out. This is where you got to think, do I just leave, report to CPS, or do I document and report to the supervisor? The correct answer here is actually A, and there's a reason why. You are a child welfare agency worker. So because we know what child welfare agency workers do, they're there to promote the well-being of the child. We know that they're do, there to support the family. The goal is to really help the family problem solve, set goals, and thrive. It's to do a risk assessment. We need to provide wraparound care. So what we would do is document report to the supervisor because this is going to become an agency issue where they might need to send out a different unit. They might need to um, provide additional support, but we are already a child welfare agency worker and the supervisor would be best be able to coordinate care, right? Um, you would kind of be reporting CPS to your own agency because you work for the child welfare agency. So that's why here it's not, and we would never just want to leave. We want to be supportive. So we would document, document what we're seeing. And from there, you can determine with the supervisor or whoever might be involved in the case, what appropriate um, services and supports are needed for this family. And why is this the immediate intervention? We have to follow agency protocols. You're already within the child welfare agency. If necessary, maybe a CPS worker will be assigned. They might already be involved with the CPS system. A caseworker might come out. Um, this would be that coordination of care. That's what this question is asking for this one. If you are looking for more content, definitely go ahead and check us out at agentsofchangeprep.com. You can always email us with more questions. We're always trying to put out new material on our platforms, and we definitely hope that you will find something that will benefit you in your study journey. And of course, I want to thank you for tuning in. Subscribe to our channel if you're looking for more content like this, and remember, you got this.